I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 33 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Rennick proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 15 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I count for senators. Five. I noted I didn't count. <laughs> I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Rennick, I give Thank you the call. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, and I'm very pleased to rise to speak to this today because standing up for workers, there's nothing uh, motivates me more than standing up for the hard-working people of this country. And let me tell you that if we bring back uh, multi pattern and bargaining in this country, it will be a job killer. And we do not want to see our hard-working battlers lose their jobs in this country. And just as importantly, we don't want to see our small businesses shut down. And believe you me, this is an attack on small business by the usual suspects, the big end of town, the big unions and the big corporations who want to drive true innovation and entrepreneurialship out of this country. Because if there's one thing that the Labor Party love, it's command and control. And that is exactly what this uh, you know, issue is all about, is having unions dictate to small businesses what sort of rules that they can have in place. Now, I want to be very clear about this. That when it comes to union membership, I'm 100 per cent behind union membership. I'm making these comments directed at the union elites, the same union elites who sit there year after year and call for superannuation rises. I mean, we've already had uh, uh, members in the other place call for a rise in superannuation of 15 per cent in the second term if Labor were to be re-elected. I'd love to know exactly what low-income earners are meant to be actually taking home in their pay if 15 per cent of their money is going off into superannuation. But make no mistake that this will hurt industry, especially small business, at a time when they cannot afford it. And that will re result in job losses and it's going to result in potentially more strikes. Now we know that what we saw what happened in the early 2000s when there were basically patent and bargaining in this country and the Productivity Commission has noted that the estimated cost of lost production from two industrial disputes across the automotive industry the year before was up to $630 million. $630 million. And we don't, do we really want to go into the history of the car manufacturing in this sector and how basically uh, inflexible labour laws were a part of the reason, not the only reason, I've, I've got my own little beef to grind with uh, withholding taxes. Uh, as well. No, 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 no. This all started, thank you very much for the interjection, Senator Green. Uh, this all started way back in 1986 to 1988 under the Button Plan, where the Button Plan that was introduced by the Hawke Keating government actually destroyed manufacturing. And it was destroyed manufacturing in this country, most notably in Victoria. Now, that, that was great because what they did straight after that, what Labor did straight after that, they brought the Dawkins Plan in. So they destroyed the manufacturing sector. Right, and then they, they pumped money, they subsidised the university sector. So now we've got degrees on gender diversity and all this sort of stuff, when we should be putting more money back in the TAFE and getting people back in the real jobs. You know, one of the things that was completely overlooked in last week's job summit was the fact that effectively the first jobs you want to fill in this country are those jobs in your primary industries. Okay? Your farmers and your miners, that's where your true wealth comes from. Then, you, once you've got those jobs filled up, then you work on your secondary industries. You go to your manufacturing industries. Yet, in this country, the Labor Party and the Greens do everything they can to destroy the primary and secondary industries. Well, let me tell you, it is the primary and secondary industries, those jobs, manufacturing, farming, mining, that create the wealth to then feed the people and help employ people in the services industry. Right? 
So if we want to actually rebuild this country, there needs to be much more focus on getting back into primary production, uh, mining and manufacturing. Okay, and, that, and, I, and I'm an unashamed protectionist. I, I put my flag to the mask in my maiden speech when I called out Deakin and Barton, the first two prime ministers in this country, who are protectionists. Because this, and, I, and I'll be honest here, this neoliberalism that, ironically enough, was introduced by the Hawke-Keating government okay, has basically lowered the barriers of the nation-state to where now okay, we've offshored just about all of our productive jobs in this country offshore. So it is incredibly important that if we're to rebuild jobs in this country, that we maintain flexibility in the workplace. Now, I totally support minimum working conditions and, and fair conditions for the worker. I want to be very clear about that. I myself come from you know, a multi-generational blue-collar family. Right? But the reason why I'm on this side of the chamber is that I believe in the individual worth, dignity and worth of every individual and people having the flexibility to make their own decisions. And I can tell you what, the Labor Party that used to believe in that, we know they don't believe that anymore. They went and introduced compulsory superannuation. They never put that to the vote, did they? And we know why they didn't, because in 1997, when New Zealand put compulsory superannuation to the vote, they lost it 92 per cent to 8. Because do you think if Paul Keating in 1992 had said to everyone, oh, look, by 2020, we're going to take 10 per cent of your wages, give it to someone you've never met, and you may or may not get it back when you're 60, and there's no capital guarantee that you're going to get it back. Do you think the people would have voted for it? Of course not. Of course not. And what has this superannuation? What has this superannuation ended up funding? I'll tell you what it's funded. It's funded the privatisation of our sovereign infrastructure. Right. So either Macquarie Bank owns it, or the foreign offshore companies own it. Okay. And we're now paying through the nose for toll roads and services. Our energy grid is on the verge of collapse because we've basically had rent-seeking privateers. Okay, in the superannuation industry, in the superannuation, you're always whinging they want more handouts, more handouts. Climate change is just this, this big virtue signalling distraction for the rent seekers in the private sector to be milking our, uh, basically uh, our essential services dry. Right? So, like I said, yet again, we have to maintain flexibility in the workplace. We have to let our small business flourish. And they are not going to be able to flourish if they've got unions breathing down their throat and out be over and beyond you know, fair working pay, minimum, minimum award conditions, forcing one set of rules from one industry onto another industry with another set of working conditions that are completely different to everyone else. To everyone else. I tell you what, this is not what we want in this country. This is not what we want in this country. We should be trying to get Australians back into jobs, in particular those Australians who exercise their right in a, in a free democratic country, not to take up a jab, which has been proven to be ineffective—10 million cases by August 22. Don't think it works. Sorry, but that's the facts. Okay, we've got hundreds of thousands, or potentially hundreds of thousands, of workers out of work here in Australia. And what does this lot on the other side do? The labour movement want to do? They want to increase immigration to push out Australian workers who chose their democratic right to choose what goes into their body. And I heard you know, um, a lady, a minister in the other place say uh, last week, oh, we're going to bring in nurses you know, because we've got a, a nursing shortage. Well, maybe we've actually got a nursing shortage because this side of the chamber continues to push out people like nurses and teachers, if they're not being vilified, out of work. So I suggest before we start talking about bringing in you know, rigid working conditions that are going to make it very difficult for small business, why you'd want to start a small business in this country with, with you know, the labour movement, with the big unions and their bullying tactics and their coercion via mandates. Where were they with the mandates? They ran a mile. They ran a mile. They do not believe in free choice. They do not believe in free choice. They don't believe in quality assurance. It's all about our way or the highway. Well, heaven help us if we have the Labor Party getting in charge, of the, in, in, in charge of industrial relations in this country. Even the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd knocked back patent and bargaining uh, in 2007. They didn't even go that far. But we know that the Prime Minister of the day, you know, he comes from the far, far, far left. Okay? If any further left, he'd fall off the edge of the planet. But that's how far left he is. And he's done a very good job of hiding his Marxist tendencies and everything like that. But don't you worry. He will be totally behind the whole, you, you will uh, be happy and own nothing. 
and he's going to do that through basically sending small business broke. Everything's going to come back and being state-owned, and while I believe sovereign infrastructure should be state-owned, I certainly don't believe that is the case in the private sector. Our small business are the true capitalists in this country, not the guys in big corporations now who are controlled by the union funds. Over 20 per cent of all of our major blue chips now are controlled by industry funds. They all have one proxy advisor. Yet again, you know, they've centralised power into the hands of a few inner-city urban elites who wouldn't know the difference between a brigalone and a box tree or hematite and magnetite. No, 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 they wouldn't know where the wealth in this country comes from. But they're more than happy to set down a whole new bunch of rules in this country and laws in this country that are going to drive small business broke and are going to actually send hard-working Australians back home in the gutter without a job. Senator Green. Oh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, here we go with the scaremongering from those opposite, and it's clear that they are deeply embarrassed about the record years of low wage growth under their former government and are suffering what I would call complete FOMO about refusing to turn up to the Jobs and Skills Summit. But this MPI gives me a chance to talk about how successful the Jobs and Skills Summit was and what were the outcomes that ha has been led to. Uh, given the Liberal Party's refusal to play a constructive role, they might have missed some of the positive outcomes that were agreed to at the summit. This includes an addition, a massive investment in free fee TAFE, an income credit for pensioners who want to get into the workforce, a fix for visa backlog and fairer updates to the parental leave provisions. This government was also able to secure positive guiding principles for a new way forward on workplace relations, because at the Jobs and Skills Summit, this government got everybody around the table. Businesses, unions and government agreed to work productively together to revitalise a culture of creativity, productivity, good faith negotiations and genuine agreement in workplace laws. That is what those opposite are opposed to, working productively together to revitalise creativity, productivity and genuine agreement in Australia's workplace laws. Last week, the Jobs and Skills Summit showed us what good government can do. This side of the chamber demonstrated what is possible when we approach problems with curiosity rather than obstinance. We have highlighted that there is nothing to be feared by governing in a way that invites a range of perspectives, even disagreement at times, but to always do so with respect. We saw that despite the scare campaign from those opposite, there is nothing to be feared in breaking bread with people who don't talk, look or act like you do. At the, same, at the Jobs and Skills Summit, we demonstrated that Australians are hungry for cooperation in the name of national interest. Obviously, there is detail that we need to consult on, and we are committed to do that. But I know that the Albanese Labor government has the stamina to settle and deliver on the principles agreed to at the summit. And I'm excited to get to work on the reforms that I know will one day mean that people in this country will have higher wages. The challenge our Jobs and Skills Summit undertook was to address these very vast and significant issues. It is very clear that the former government is embarrassed about the low wage growth over nine long years in government and is now trying to mobilise a fear campaign about plans to get wages moving again. The truth is it was never harder to get a pay rise than under the previous government, and that has to change. In Australia, minimum standards are set by the Fair Work Commission, and if you want a wage increase above the legal minimum, you must bargain with your employer for it. In order to get a pay rise, workers in particular workplaces have to go through a complicated and lengthy process called enterprise bargaining. There are very long and technical steps that workers and their employers must go through to secure an enterprise bargaining agreement. And currently, workers are only able to bargain workplace to workplace. This system has brought in over 30 years ago, and both workers and employers are saying that it is no longer fit for purpose. And certainly, at the roundtables that I held in the lead up to the summit in Mariba, in Cairns, and in Townsville, that is exactly what I was hearing from employers and workers alike that something needed to be done 
to improve the complexity of this system. Enterprise bargaining was introduced at a time when workplaces had many more workers and giving them more power to bargain for good wages and conditions. Only one in every seven workers is currently covered by an EBA, meaning most workers aren't receiving regular wage rises. For those lucky, one in seven, the system still isn't delivering, and it didn't deliver under nine years of the Liberal National Party. Workplaces are much smaller than they were when enterprise bargaining was introduced, meaning workers have fewer resources and power to bargain on, even, on an even footing with their employers. Workers and businesses are calling for multi-employer bargaining. It's nothing to be afraid of. Those opposite will try to create a scare campaign around it. But the Australian Union Movement, the representative organisation for small businesses, COSBOA, have come together to put forward sensible reform that allows for collective bargaining to take the most appropriate form for industry that it is serving. Multi-employer bargaining allows workers who do the same job across multiple employers to bargain together for wage increases. Now, I'll give you an example of this because I know that there will be a lot of misinformation coming from the other side of this chamber. But for example, every childcare centre in Australia has their own set of wages and conditions, and under a multi-employer bargaining model, all early childhood educators could possibly come together beyond their own centre and bargain for an industry-wide increase. There is no denying that childcare workers are some of our lowest paid workers, and yet they do some of the most important work. It boggles the mind how those opposite could be opposed to an instrument that would lead to wage rises for some of our lowest paid, highly feminised workforces. More people means more power, which improves our chances of winning good wages and conditions for lower paid workers. It is also good for business because the current EBA process means employers have to fork out big sums of money to consultancies to navigate a complex system. This would make it easier for both workers and employers to negotiate and settle fair wage increases. The proposal which has come from the ACTU but also from business uh, um, opens up the prospect of wage growth and collective bargaining for thousands more workers. Surely, surely those opposite could not be opposed to more workers in our economy getting a wage increase. It is a critical step in tackling the wage crisis because when more workers and employers are able to bargain for wage increases, the earning capacity of working Australians continues to grow. Labor continues to maintain that a fair day's wage for a fair day's work is a core value of ours, and we will always stand up to it. And despite the scaremongering of those opposite, we will always stand here proudly representing unions and union members. There is no amount of intimidation that those opposite can level out that would make us step away from those values. Because let's be clear who those opposite are talking about when they're speaking about unions. Union members are frontline workers, and a majority of them are women. Nurses are union members. Teachers are union members. Aged care workers are union members. Cleaners, pilots, bus drivers, these are all union members. And it's highly likely that the very people that were hailed as heroes by those opposite during the pandemic hold a union ticket. Even our sporting heroes are union members. The Matildas are a fantastic football team and a national icon. They are union members and they took collective action. They went on strike so that they could get equal pay. And they delivered a historic pay deal, which is unique to this part of the world. Look, union members don't take legal protected industrial action lightly. And when they do, they do it because they've exhausted every other avenue available to them. On the rare occasion that union members take the long, complex and difficult step of collective action, 
It is because they have taken exhaustive legal steps to get there. But don't let the other side of this chamber fool you. It was collective action that won a 38-hour week. It won annual leave. It won health and safety standards that make sure that when we go home in the same condition we arrived in at work. Chances are, if your job has good wages and conditions, you have a union member to thank for that. It is finally time for those opposite to stop the conflict, build a consensus, come together with us on this to solve the challenges that our country is facing. That is how we will get wages moving again in this country, because every Australian worker deserves a seat at the table and every Australian worker deserves fair wages and fair conditions. Thank you, Senator. Senator Orman Pang. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this motion as a proud unionist. Unions are essential to the protection and advancement of workers' rights in this country. They ensure that the economic, social and environmental interests of workers are protected. All Australian workers should have a fair pay for fair work, but the reality is that many workers are falling through the gaps of our industrial relations system because they have been hamstrung by successive governments who have denied them the right to collectively bargain across sectors. The assertion that industry-wide bargaining would result in large parts of the Australian economy being shut down is nothing but a scare tactic. The Coalition's attempt to make unions and the rights of workers their political punching bag should be strongly rejected. It is a sentiment that is inherently damaging to the rights of Australian workers. But this is to be expected from an opposition that is out of ideas and out of energy. All they know how to do is run scare campaigns and attack workers. The lack of creativity is truly breathtaking. But we shouldn't be surprised. This run-of-the-mill stuff from the Liberals and Nationals who have not had an approach to workplace relations in their history that doesn't involve deliberately making wages stagnate and trampling on working people. The Greens are in agreement with the ACTU on the need for the implementation of industry-wide bargaining and we welcome the commitment by the government to its reintroduction. All the evidence shows that enterprise agreements negotiated by unions result in better pay and conditions for workers. We want to see more workers covered by these agreements and more workers being represented by their union. Union membership has been dropping for too many years. Today, only 14 per cent of employees are members of trade unions and less in the private sector. This drop in union membership is a direct result of deliberate policy by successive governments dismantling legislative support for unions, restrictions on organising and forcing workers to negotiate individually with their employers. Today we see a continued lack of political commitment to encouraging the increase of union membership. Even this morning the Prime Minister refused to commit to encouraging increased union membership. As head of the so-called Workers' Party, his lack of support for union participation is disappointing. Falling membership and decreased collective bargaining power only serves to negatively affect Australians' living standards. We need stronger unions today. Unions are their members. When the coalition and big business denigrate unions, they are in fact attacking working people. Today, more women than men are members of unions. Industry-wide bargaining is particularly important and relevant for employees in traditionally female-dominated industries. The face of modern unionism has changed and increasingly union members are frontline workers in aged care, early childhood education and teaching. In that sense, I am perhaps the archetypal union thug, and I've been a proud union thug for 30 years. By improving the bargaining power of workers, we are not going to see the Australian economy being shut down as a result of strike action, as Senator Rennick has asserted. It says a lot about the Liberal and National Party's lack of understanding about what matters to Australians that this is their primary focus. Increasingly, we are seeing industries such as early childhood education and aged care being eroded as workers leave these sectors due to inadequate wages. Improving worker pay in sectors such as early childhood education and aged care would go a long way towards improving the current gender-based economic inequity in inequity in Australia and ensuring that the deficiencies in workers' wages do not force them into a cost-of-living crisis. 
In focusing on the potential for strikes as the predominant issue facing our economy, Senator Rennick has demonstrated once again how the Liberals side with corporations rather than working people. Australians need wage rises now to deal with the increasing costs of living. Access to industry-wide bargaining is an essential element to ensure Australians' wages continue increasing to meet the demands of inflation and prevent a cost-of-living crisis. This is why the adoption of industry-wide bargaining is so important. Instead of being scared of the potential for strikes, we should be scared of the impacts the cost-of-living crisis will have on Australians. Fearing strikes cannot be the perennial reason for a lack of support for union strength, increasing union membership and expanding workers' rights. Stronger unions are an essential part of ensuring all workers receive equ equitable wages and fair working conditions. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm going to take issue with what the previous speaker has just said, because Australia cannot afford a backward step to the past. Anybody who lived through the 1970s and the 1980s would remember that there wasn't a risk of an economy-wide shutdown. There was action taken in support of economy-wide shutdowns. And it would appear that this is something that is missed by so many on the other side. Without a doubt, the deal that has been done between the Albanese Labor government and the ACTU well and truly shows that under Mr Albanese, as Prime Minister of Australia, the Australian Labor Party are beholden nothing more and nothing less to the union movement. But what is worse is that they're actually paying back their paymaster. Because when you look at the threat of damaging industrial action, because that's exactly what this is designed to do, the Albanese government is about to deliver that in full to Australians. Because anybody who understands the history of the Industrial Relations Act would understand that this type of behaviour was actually ruled out and made illegal by the former Keating government. And in fact, even former Labor Prime Ministers, in Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister Gillard, even they recognised the need to ensure that this type of behaviour did not return. Even former Labor Prime Ministers, Prime Minister Gillard and Prime Minister Rudd, and they were pressed by the ACTU at the time, they were pressed by the, the union movement, but they stood their ground. They stood their ground and they refused to capitulate. Why? Because they understood that the last thing that Australia needed under their former Labor governments was a return to the dark old days of economy-wide shutdowns. And again, what is conveniently missed by those opposite in this debate is that under Labor's Fair Work Act, so that's the Fair Work Act that was put together under the former Rudd and Gillard governments, multi-employer bargaining is actually allowed. Two employers can get together if they want, and they can actually bargain for an enterprise agreement. What they also forget to tell the Australian people is that under Labor's Fair Work Act, the act that they're now saying is just not working, well, they certainly didn't say that the last time they were in government. There is also a low-paid bargaining stream in the Fair Work Act, and again, what that does is permits multi-employer bargaining for low-paid workers. So, despite everything that those opposite are saying, the Fair Work Act, Labor's Fair Work Act, as it currently stands, the act that they designed already allows multi-employer bargaining and already allows multi-employer bargaining for low-paid workers. And in fact, when you look at why, under the former Labor government, this was actually inserted, the stream was designed for sectors such as the aged care and community services, the very sectors that the ACTU constantly refers to in arguing for an industry bargaining system. So you do then need to ask yourself, well, hey, hold on. If Labor's Fair Work Act, 
the Fair Work Act that was put in place by the former Labor government, at this point in time currently allows for multi-employer bargaining, but also has the ability for employers to get together in terms of the low-paid bargaining stream. Why is Labor making announcements with the ACTU that they would actually like to introduce multi-employer bargaining? Because we know under the current streams you can't take strike action. So the only change that Labor are putting forward under the guise of allowing this type of bargaining, because it is already allowed under the Fair Work Act, is to acquiesce to their paymasters, the Australian Union movement, and to allow industrial action, economy-wide shutdowns, under the Albanese government. So, for those who lived through the dark old days of the 70s and 80s, you will recall that during those periods of time, when the industrial action was actually unlawful, but that did not stop people, you had general strikes, you had airline strikes, you had public transport strikes, you had beer strikes, you had waterfront strikes, and you also had retail strikes. When Mr Albanese says that I would like to deliver full employment, real wage increases and productivity gains, and that is what the summit is going to deliver, Blind Freddy can actually tell you that full employment, real wage increases and productivity gains are not going to be realised if the Albanese government legislates the ACTU's demands for sector-wide bargaining. You'll also be able to have sympathy strikes. So you can actually have all sorts of workplaces that have no relationship whatsoever with those who are seeking to go out on strike. They will be able to go on strike. So in my home state of Perth, you could have workers in New South Wales taking industrial action, and workers in Perth will be able to go on strike in support of them. You tell me. A business that is forced to close because its workers are on strike, how does that deliver full employment? How does that deliver real wage increases? How does that deliver productivity gains? Because ultimately, that is what Mr Albanese said the summit would deliver. And yet all we have seen so far is a talk fest is a glorified networking event and then some window dressing for decisions that by and large have already been made by the Albanese government to appease their union paymasters. And on that note, it is a fact that unions currently represent less than 10 per cent of the private sector workforce. And yet when you look at how many of them were invited to the summit, they had around 33 seats at the summit table. And yet small businesses who on any analysis represent the backbone of the Australian economy, they are well and truly the job makers of our economy. They represent 41 per cent of our workforce. Australians might be interested to know they had one seat. One seat at the table. So despite all of the rhetoric that we are hearing from Prime Minister Albanese, I'm pro-worker, I'm pro-employer, small businesses representing 41 per cent of our workforce had one seat at the summit, and unions who represent less than 10 per cent of the private sector workforce had over 25 per cent of the seats at the summit. In life, it's a very simple equation. A business that has to close employs no one. And that is what we are going to see if and when Labor go down the path of legislating the ACTU's demands of industry-wide bargaining. Imagine the impact that strikes will have on supply chains. Supply chains under the Albanese government will be absolutely crushed. What happens when you destroy a supply chain? It leads to instability in workplaces. When you have instability in workplaces, 
What do you end up with? Higher unemployment, less profitability within businesses and a negative impact all over the Australian economy. What are families and businesses looking for out of the Albanese government? They're actually looking for a plan to address the rising cost of living. And yet, what they have been given by the Albanese government is a government that is showing they're actually not interested in addressing the rising costs of living, because even after 100 days, we still have not seen anything concrete put forward that would do just that. But what we have seen is that they are more than happy to capitulate to and entertain the outrageous demands from the ACTU. And as I said, under this government, general strikes, airline strikes, public transport strikes, beer strikes, waterfront strikes and retail strikes, that is what they are going to deliver to the Australian people. That is not a plan to address the cost of living. Senator Chisholm, you have the call. Uh, thanks, Adam, Acting Deputy President. And I must say, I thought Senator Rennick's contribution was going to be the most unhinged part of this debate, but Senator Cash well and truly uh, took over from that. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU, who are in here, and uh, Robert from the ASU as well, um, who I, I gather are here to hear uh, Senator White's first speech, and a really good unionist, some, someone who will add uh, fantastic, will make a fantastic contribution to the Senate at the same time. Um, but there's plenty of things I'm happy about the election win. Um, obviously, being in government, having the opportunity to change the country is significant. But I'm also pleased that the opposition kept Senator Cash in that portfolio, because it is a real reminder to workers whose side is on who's on the workers' side in this chamber. And I think if you went to Australians and said, what was the last election about? What was really a significant thing? What did Albo really stand for in the election campaign? And that was he wanted to see workers get a pay rise. And he was attacked for that by the now opposition. He was attacked for that in the media. But if you look at our record in what we have done in government, that is absolutely what we are focused on. The first act of the, of the Albanese Labor cabinet was to support a wage rise for those on the minimum raise. We've also seen now a commitment when it comes to aged care workers uh, and support for them to get a wage rise as well uh, once that decision is made. So there is absolutely no doubt for the Australian people, and it's only further emphasised by the unhinged attack we've seen from the opposition to the Jobs and Skills Summit that they still just don't get it, that we are on the side of workers, we're proud to be on the side of workers, and we want to deliver for workers um, as part of an Albanese Labor government. And it also shows that they have learnt nothing from the election campaign. They took no lessons from the election campaign. The Jobs and Skills Summit was about bringing people together. It was about trying to seek common ground, because no one involved in labour relations in this country thinks that the current system is working. Uh, that was clear in the lead-up, it was clear at the summit itself, and that's why we want to work together. And it is, says so much about this government, uh, this opposition, that they've completely missed the mark on that. They failed to understand uh, what our motivation is uh, and why we are seeking to bring Australians together on this. And the Jobs and Skills Summit, it didn't culminate uh, Thursday, Friday last week. There was ongoing work that will continue to happen, but also it was about the lead-up work that was done by the government, the roundtables that we had. I think it was almost 100 roundtables that we held in different geographic regions, uh, different industries, and that led to uh, the optimism that we saw on display on Thursday, Friday. And we we're all part of getting out there and listening. So the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, and myself, uh, we we're in Rockhampton on, and on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, we had roundtables. We involved uh, local workforce. We had councils. We had unions. Uh, we wanted to ensure that we heard from a broad cross-section of the community. Uh, I was last week. I was in Roma and did a community uh, lunch with about 30 or 40 people from Roma in Western Queensland, and they were excited and were openly talking about what the Jobs and Skills Summit would bring and the opportunity it would bring for regional and rural Australia as well. And then on Wednesday before the Jobs Summit. I was at the Business Council of Australia dinner where the Prime Minister was the guest speaker. And those business leaders 
could not leave quick enough to get to Canberra because they wanted to be part of the conversation as well. So they took it in the right spirit about what this government is trying to achieve by working constructively with people. And what are the opposition so upset about? Why are they so unhinged? Why are we getting this ridiculous scare campaign of Senator Cass saying it's going to be back to the 1950s or 1960s? No one is advocating that. All we are wanting to see is that workers get a fair go, um, that they can bargain effectively to get a pay rise. But as part of that, and what we all want to see, is the, the economic system working for the advantage of workers, but also those people who want an increase in productivity at the same time. So it is completely reasonable for this government um, to go about consulting with people, um, finding the best way forward, trying to work constructively where that happens, uh, and ensuring that we can take the country forward as a result. Uh, that is why we elected. That is in how we intend on governing. And I think the Australian people are seeing a government that is committed to listening, that is committed to consulting, and is committed to working with everyone in the best interests of Australia. And it shouldn't be revolutionary. That's actually how governments of all persuasions should act. But the fact is, it is revolutionary because for 10 years we saw none of it. We saw 10 years of deliberate low wages because that was actually a deliberate design feature of the economy that the former finance minister said. Uh, so this government is committed to turning that around. Uh, we're committed to, where possible, uh, working with uh, all cross-sections of the economy to ensure that we can achieve these goals and achieve these gains. And the Jobs and Skills Summit was a key part of that. But it is absolutely illustrative that the response from those opposite, um, failing to see the direction that this government is taking, failure to see the support from the Australian people that we want to take uh, this direction of this country in, that they are missing the mark, they're reverting to their same old scare campaigns uh, that isn't going to work, but it isn't going to distract us from achieving the goals that we want to achieve. And if you look at the last decade, uh, real wages have gone backwards in this country. Uh, the opposition, uh, whilst in government, spent 10 years looking for every opportunity they had to attack workers. Uh, we saw from Senator, from Senator Cash when she was a minister um, the attack on unions and raids on union officers. They had anti-worker legislation that they tried to introduce in the cover of the pandemic as well. And now, instead of focusing on the positives of bringing Australians together at the Jobs and Skills Summit, they are trying to run a desperate scare campaign, and we've seen that in the contributions on this MPI. They haven't learnt that the Australian people want an opposition who are constructive, one that will work with the government to improve legislation, like we did in the previous parliament. The Australian business community understand that. The uh, social sector understand that, the unions understand that, but it's something that the opposition are still failing to heed. And the Albanese Labor government knows that we need to get wages moving again. That is why we are so focused on the Jobs and Skills Summit being a success, because we know how important this is to the Australian people and those people who have been doing it tough after 10 years of no wage growth. But despite the opposition's scare campaigns, uh, this was a summit that brought together government, employers, unions and the broader community, including David Littleproud as the National Party leader. The summit came up with a solution to build a bigger and better trained and more productive workforce that's focused on boosting real wages, living standards and create more opportunities for Australians as well. The one thing that all sides agreed on was that we need a new approach and that the current industrial relations system isn't working. The Albanese Labor government has listened and is acting. We will legislate to create more flexible flexibility for workers and businesses to reach agreement and get wages moving. We are making changes to close loopholes in the Fair Work Act, loopholes that allow wages to go down. So, instead of looking for solutions, the opposition are running the same tired scare campaigns that they did in government. They aren't wanting to work together to improve the system working for businesses and workers so that we can increase productivity and include wages. They talked a lot about small business, but the fact is, is that the Small Business Council of Australia were represented. And what they said was, and what Alexi Boyd said was, 
What we're hearing from our members is some of them are saying that this is something they would like to look into. It's as simple as that. So we've seen some constructive comments from the small business community. And as the Prime Minister said this morning on ABC Radio, I see myself as pro-business and pro-worker. I see that there is common interest between business and unions, that Australia works best when we're all headed in the one direction, when there's that spirit of cooperation, and that is the spirit which I wish to foster. That's the spirit that I saw in evidence over the two days at the summit. So you can see the clear contrast there between a government that wants to make progress on these issues because we understand how important they are for the Australian people. We want to see unions being able to re represent their workers and be able to achieve success for their workers in terms of productivity, in terms of wages and in terms of job conditions. But we also understand that we need businesses to thrive at the same time. And that's what bringing people together at a summit will achieve. Uh, none of the nonsense that we've seen from those opposite is going to achieve anything. We are going to be focused on delivering for Australian workers, on delivering for the Australian community, and workers of Australia will know that an Albanese Labor government is absolutely on their side, and we will always be on their side. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. You, Madam Acting Deputy President, this is a grave matter of public concern. As inflation and cost of living skyrockets, Australian workers were hoping for a pay rise to keep up. Instead, the Albanese government is using the Jobs and Skills Summit as cover for flooding the country with unsustainable immigration levels. Prime Minister Albanese's immigration flood will increase the number of workers looking for work, and that will keep Australian wages down. What a sick joke. The Labor Party increasing immigration to suppress wages as its way of fighting for the workers. Pretending to care about workers is a signature of the Albanese government's approach. Instead of pretense, we need comprehensive reform in this country. The Fair Work Act, which I'm showing you here, is a mammoth, complex, confusing patchwork of red tape that gives small business nightmares and leaves workers like casual workers in central Queensland and the Hunter without basic protections and entitlements. Senator Chisholm is correct. He said that everyone knows it's a problem. It certainly is a problem. Instead of this, we need simple, effective industrial relations reform that doesn't just benefit the IR club of union bosses, lawyers and multinational companies. Next, we turn to the Albanese government's key strategy, the government's apparent intention to adopt industry-wide bargaining. It'll sledgehammer Australian businesses, especially small business, and it'll sledgehammer workers. If the Albanese government proceeds with this repackaged pattern bargaining, untold damage will be done to our economy. This isn't speculation. This has been done before. It's all happened before. A 2002 Productivity Commission inquiry found that just two industrial disputes in the automotive industry the year before cost $630 million in lost production. In today's dollars, that's more than a billion. It's worth explaining what this damage could mean. Currently, if workers want to go on strike against a particular company, as is their right, like the Qantas baggage handler strike happening right now, criteria must be met for the strike to be lawful. That's Qantas baggage handlers striking for benefits from Qantas. In industry-wide bargaining, the Qantas strike would automatically allow Virgin staff to go on strike, even though their pay conditions and employer are completely different. Industry bargaining means entire industries can be shut down even if there's only one company treating employees poorly. Imagine one cafe having a strike and that automatically triggering strikes across the hospitality industry, even at cafes already paying their employees well and treating them fairly. Paralyzing entire industries because of disputes with one employer in that industry is reckless and in the long run will harm workers. It's done as a reward for union bosses donating tens of millions of dollars to Labor's election campaign. In return, the Prime Minister gives union bosses more power so they can continue to betray honest union members in deals with multinationals. The Labor Party continues to abandon Australian workers. One Nation will Thank continue you, to Senator, fight for workers your and small time businesses. Has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I have great pleasure today in rising to contribute to this very important MPI and note that it, uh, it didn't take too long, did it, Madam Acting Deputy President, for uh, this government to be able to come here and be up to their old tricks, uh, less than 100 days, they're up to their old tricks and already they're demonstrating that uh, really who's in charge is just the, uh, the union mates, uh, those, their paymasters. And 
On the back of uh, channelling the former Hawke government with a summit of words and no action, now the government has heeded the union's clarion call for industry-wide bargaining power. Never mind the inflation crisis, which is of course an issue that many Australians are facing, all Australians are facing, and high interest rates and the spiralling cost of living pressures on all Australians. No, this government is intent post talk fest uh, is ensuring that unions are happy running amok in the Australian workplace. Business and industries of all sizes are rightly concerned at this sudden development. Why? Because through industry wide bargaining, unions may seek to weaponise strike action once again through protected action. Now, this should alarm everyone. The risk of economy wide shutdown is a regression back to the 1970s and 80s, which Australians in this generation and now for a couple of generations have frankly never experienced, and they wouldn't want to. But be in no doubt, industrial striking is an instrument of sector-wide bargaining. In the 1970s, when industry-wide strikes were common and the Australian in industry were protected by high tariff barriers, you don't have to go far to see what the damaging impacts of strike action had on the Australian economy. Now, data assembled by Dr Jim Stanford uh, indicates that in the 1970s the average number of industrial disputes each year were 2,300. Yet in the period of 2010 to 2018 there was an average of 198. You only have to remember the dire state in Britain. Uh, in the 1970s, when strike action was out of control and crippling the British economy. It culminated with the famous winter of discontent. Crisis. What crisis? yelled the British press during the dying days of a British Labor government. And now, in 2022, it's back to the future again. In New South Wales, we're seeing the rail strikes, particularly in Sydney, while up in Brisbane, the CFMEU is flexing its muscle and picketing in the Brisbane CBD. It's also calling for industrial action at airports, which would pose significant threat to an already precarious industry because of, COVID, because of the COVID pandemic. And we know what the disruption has been in that industry. The last thing they need is to have that compounded by further industrial action. Nothing emboldens unions more than the ascent of office to office of a federal Labor government. And that's what we're seeing right now. In the past, the Labor Party rejected the coalition's modest changes, modest changes to the better off overall test. Interestingly, a September 4, uh, 2022 Australian Financial Review article quoted former Prime Minister Paul Keating as saying that the boot is overprescriptive, while former ACTU uh, Bill Kelty said it was crazy. I quote, crazy, he said. Now, this government should work uh, with the coalition to ensure that the Australian workplace remains harmonious. Our economy depends on this, colleagues. Our economy depends on this. This is the last thing that we would want to see. We cannot revert back to the bleak days of a bygone era. The last thing that this country needs during an environment of high inflation, high interest rates, interest rates increasing and an out of control cost of living is unions gridlocking the Australian economy. It is for these reasons that I support this motion here today. Who is in charge of the agenda of this government? Who is in charge of the progression of our economy? Well, it's seemingly to be, it seems to be the unions. The unions were in force at the summit last week. There were over 30 unions, 30 union officials, 33, 34 union officials. Yet there were only seven West Australians present at that meeting. So who's in charge? Who's in charge? Who's listening to the interests of the economy, listening to the interests of those that are creating the jobs, that have actually got the jobs to make available for Australians to be able to take up? And sadly, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it's the unions that are in control. And this lot over here, that's their paymasters, and that's what's happening. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. We have Senator Shoebridge. Deputy President, what we're seeing here in the Senate today is yet another attempt by the coalition to attack workers at a time when their side of the economy, when capital, is extracting ever more money from the economic system and workers are seeing even less in their pockets. 
It's no wonder we've seen this motion come from the coalition. They, they didn't attend the job summit. They're bereft of positive ideas, so they come in here with a scare campaign that industry-wide bargaining is, is somehow going to cause sector-wide strikes and industrial chaos. Where in, in fact, what we know it will produce, what we know it will produce, is fair wages, particularly for those feminised part of our workforce, those with least bargaining power, who most need help at the moment dealing with the cost of living crisis. So it's no wonder the coalition come in here with their scare campaign. They're happy because profits are up, shareholders are doing well. Profits are up, CEO bonuses are bigger than ever. They're happy, tick. But while profits are up, wages are stagnant. And right now, we know that an ever smaller percentage of the national uh, pie is going to workers in the form of wages, and yet more and more is being delivered to profits and shareholders and CEOs and senior executives. And we have an obligation to rebalance this system. So it goes some way to delivering a fair go. And allowing unions to properly represent their workers with pay deals that deliver consistent pay rates across employers is not something to be afraid of. It's called fairness. It's called equity. And I know that's what scares the coalition, but for the most of the rest of the country, it's what they want the industrial relations system to deliver. Fairness and equity and a growth in real wages. Small businesses and others that pay their workers fairly aren't concerned about these moves to put workers on a fairer footing. Isolating workers in some workplaces, particularly those with less bargaining power, um, has been the history of the last 30 years. And what that means is that workers with less power, like those in feminised industries, the care industry, the services industries, miss out on the better wages and conditions that are negotiated in, in workplaces with greater union density and greater ability to put economic pressure on the system. If change doesn't happen, those workers who have been left behind for the last 30 years will be left behind for the next 30 years. And the gap between the haves and the have-nots in this society will rise and rise. Now, employers, some minority of employers, and, and their friends in the coalition are still pushing to have workers fragment, fragmented, unable to bargain together, because they recognise that workers coming together and fairly bargaining will see wages form a greater share of the economy. Workers looking at their paychecks over the last decade have seen precious little growth and, 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 and often reductions in the real wages that they're bringing home, all the more so as we see inflation rise with cost of living pressures. It makes the astronomical housing prices in Australia and the growing cost of living a real and ongoing threat. And this parliament has an obligation to respond to it. What we do know is that our economy is more dominated than ever by the services and the care industries. And this is something the ACTU has said clearly in making the case for industry-wide bargaining. And as that, the economy has changed, we still have an industrial relations system that's, that's, that's 30 years old, that has failed to take into account those fundamental changes, and particularly those workers in smaller workplaces, in the care sectors, often workplaces that are dominated by women. They need to have the ability to engage in collective bargaining, and it's best done on an industry-wide level. As, as the ACTU said, the president of the ACTU said, allowing workers to band together across, across workplaces to bargain is an essential way of getting wages moving again after a lost decade of flatlining wages and real wage cuts. It should be unacceptable to all of us that real wage cuts are projected year on year. Now, Madam Deputy President, we will not get meaningful movement on wages unless we can, act, unless we can move on industry-wide bargaining. It scares the coalition, but I've got to tell you, there are workers out there who have had 30 years of flatlining wages, who are desperately keen for this parliament to do more than carp and complain, but actually give them power give them a fair wage and finally see a fair share of the pie go to those you, in the workplaces Schubert, who deliver.